All right, we're talking about the promises of God this morning. Could you get the message? So what are promises? Children, did you study anything about promises this morning? Tell me about it. What is a promise? Come on. Some of the... Okay, so it's a guarantee that you will do something that you've said you will do, right? Now, what... What is it that is important about a promise in terms of the person that made the promise? Let me put it this way. Do you count on the promise more if you trust the person that made the promise? What if you don't trust the person that made the promise? then maybe the promise doesn't get fulfilled. So the trustworthiness of the person is kind of important, isn't it? Well, do you know that God has made promises to you? And the credibility of God in terms of him keeping his promises is 100%. Now, the promise we're going to talk about this morning that begins Second Peter is, to me, one of the most incredible promises in all of God's Word as it regards how we live every day. This promise is something that if you will genuinely trust, when I say trust, what do I mean? Have faith, have trust, Believe, put your faith into where you're actually going to put something on this promise that you're counting on it being true, right? You're going to count on it being true. I've told you the story before about the missionary that's writing and translating the Bible down in South America. And he came to, to a passage that talked about a promise or faith or belief. And, he, and the tribe had no, no concept of belief. No concept of what faith was. No concept of of trusting anybody else. It wasn't in their character, it wasn't in their nature, was not in their vocabulary, literally. And so he was looking for a word to translate in the Bible every time it said believe or faith. And he had struggled with this for weeks and weeks and weeks. And finally one day he's sitting in a hut uh, and this man comes in And he literally throws himself into the hammock that's there. And he said, whoa, 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 wait, what what did you just do? And he, he, he gave him a word for what he had done in throwing all his weight on that hammock. And he says, that's trust, that's faith. You had faith that that hammock would hold you up. And that's what trust is, that's what faith is. Trusting the promise of God is not just done in words. (laughs) In fact, if you're just doing it in words only and your life does not reflect that promise, you do not have faith in what you say you have faith in. It's just words. And what Peter's going to want to tell them today is something that is absolutely critical. Now, it's important that you know something about what's happening around here. You know what happened in 1 Peter, and those people were under great persecution, and Peter was teaching them what they needed to know to face the enemy at the end, right? So when we get to 2 Peter, I, what I want you to know is this, and you're going to find this in the text this morning. Peter 
is facing imminent death because of his faith. Christians are being persecuted. He is just ready, and he knows it. He's going to tell us he knows this is coming. He is getting ready to lay his life down for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things that that is, I think, important that we understand that if you were on your last breath, literally hours or maybe a couple of days to live, probably what you would say to those that you love and care about would be well thought out. It would be the most important thing that you could say to them. Why? Because this is your finale. This is your final thought. This is what is most important to your life that you want to convey to your children, to your grandchildren, to those that you love. Peter is in this position of now conveying to the church as he writes all of these churches in the area. We'll see them shortly. He's writing all of these churches and he is going to say to them what is most important, what he has learned is of the highest value in his Christian faith. And what he's going to tell them, what he's going to talk about, is this promise, this one promise of God. He says this, if you will understand what this promise is, if you will get a hold of the reality of what God is telling you in this promise, and if you will then, here's that A word, appropriate, bring application to, that promise in your life, everything will change and you will literally, listen to me very, very carefully, you will literally appropriate the power of God for your life every day. Now, does that sound like something that you might want to know? That's what Peter's going to do today. What's the effects of the surety of the promise? What affects the surety of the promise is the worthiness of the person making the promise. And this, today, is a promise of God to his people. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Now in verse number 14, down here, we find out that what I'm telling you and have told you about his life coming to an end is true. Here's what he says. Knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also the Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Christ has made clear to Peter this is his final hurrah. Now most of us don't know exactly when we're going to die. I doubt very seriously if anybody in here does. But Peter's been given... Here's your fuse. You have this much time to convey to your people, the people you love, the most important thing you've learned about your faith. And that's what Peter's going to do in the next few minutes here. Verse number 2, 2 Peter chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Sort of a common greeting But understand, this is Peter's objective. What he is going to convey in the promises of God, he says that grace and peace, that genuine peace of God that passes all understanding, is available to you on a moment-by-moment basis in your life. And the promise God makes, us, us bringing application to the promise God makes, is going to give us this grace and peace. He says, may it be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. We're going to come back and look at that word knowledge in a minute because that's not the normal word that I've talked about so much for knowledge that's, that's throughout the rest of the Bible. In fact, this word for knowledge is only used four or five times in all of Scripture. And it's very specific that you understand, very important you understand it in relationship to the rest of this text. It literally is is translated in the NET Bible as, he says, in the knowledge as you grow, as you grow in your faith, as you grow in your faith. This knowledge he's going to talk about is a growing faith kind of knowledge. Okay? 
So let's put that into the text since the NET does that, and I think it's a good translation, at least with regard to this. Verse number three. Here's the verse. Listen to the words. Jot down a note, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. Here's a promise of God. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Listen to it again. Seeing that his divine power Power. Whose divine power? God's divine power has granted to us. Is that present tense, past tense, future? It's, it's, it's right now. It's coming. It's, 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 he's already granted it. It's, it listen, it's, it's already a done deal. You can't earn this. As a, listen, if you're a Christ follower, he has already granted this to you. You have it in your possession. You have it in your possession. Have you appropriated it? That's the question. He has granted to us everything. A few things. Some things. Everything. He has granted to us everything, what? Pertaining to life? And godliness, and we're going to take a look at, the, look at that word godliness in a minute. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own. How was it granted to us in life and godliness? Through what? The true knowledge. There's that word, that interesting word for knowledge we're going to talk about again. The knowledge of him. How do we appropriate that which has already been granted to us? I come up and I have a gift. I am granting this gift to Robin. I'm going to lay it right here and I'm going to say, this is yours, Robin. And if he gets up and leaves the church and doesn't take that with him, never unwraps the gift, it can be his all day long and he has never appropriated that which I have given him. And this is the condition of most people who identify themselves as Christ's followers today. They've never appropriated. Now listen, not every promise in the Bible is for every Christian. Some promises are only for specific people or specific times and places. But this promise is a universal promise to every Christ follower. His divine power has granted to us, His divine power has granted to us, can I trust that his power is sufficient to grant me this? Can I trust that if he says he's done it, he's done it? Okay, hold on to that. Let me tell you why I want you to hold on to it. Because if I don't tell you right now, you may not even try. Because what he is going to call on us to do as Christ followers... If he were just to tell us all of that, here's what I want you to do, here's how I want you to do it, here's where I want you to go, here's where I want, here's where I want you to talk to. These are the things that, that you must be faithful in. When I say faithful, I mean consistent, persistent. You're there, you're doing it, you're faithful. Those things would scare us to death if we thought we had to appropriate the power or we had to appropriate the means but he says, all of that's already been granted to you, and you will not only be able to accomplish these things, but you will have peace, and it will be multiplied to you in gra the grace of God in your life as you go about this daily living. Now, this is a powerful promise of God that most of you still will walk out of here this morning and forget by this afternoon. But you shouldn't. This is, this is the promise. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him. By what? Through what? The true knowledge of him. Okay, let's look at some of these words. Here's that word knowledge. 
Now, most of the time, the word knowledge, the Greek word for knowledge is gnosis. This is a strange form of that. Like I say, it's only used a few times, and it's called epinoso, epinosko. Epinosko is to recognize. It is more intense than just gnosis, which is normally the word that's used for knowledge. It's more intense than that. Why? Because it expresses a more thorough, what's that word? Participation in the acquiring of the knowledge on the part of the learner. A more thorough participation in acquiring the knowledge on the part of the learner. In the New Testament, it often refers to the knowledge which is very powerfully influenced the form of religious life, a knowledge of laying claim to personal involvement. This is a knowledge, listen to me, let me make it real simple. This is a knowledge that says, okay, let, let's, let's just take an example. We had a class in here one time for evangelism. And I taught you a lot of stuff about evangelism. We had, I recommended some books that are some of the best out there anywhere on evangelism. But do you know that there's nobody that was at that class that got Epinosco until they left here and they went and participated in doing evangelism. Then they realized the fullness of this word. Until then it was just gnosis. It was just, it was head knowledge. It was just an idea in your mind that you knew the rules to. In the New Testament, it refers to a knowledge which very powerfully influenced the form of religious life, a knowledge laying claim to personal involvement. In other words, without personal involvement on an ongoing, consistent, faithful basis, you will never experience epinosco. And when you do, you'll wonder why you, ne you ever waited so long to do it, and when you do, you'll wonder why everybody else doesn't. And when you do, you find that God begins to work. And you find 14 guys come to know the Lord in just a few months this year at the prison. You'll find baptisms like we're having next Saturday afternoon up there happening. Why? Because people begin to acknowledge the fact that God is moving in your life in a way they've never seen Him move anywhere else. Now when that happens, let me tell you what else happens. The church begins to be the church. Until then, the church is not really the church, it's church in name only. Am I making myself plain this morning? Okay. Here, here is the purpose. Here is the purpose, listen. Listen. It's by His own glory and excellence. It is, it is, we're going to change this word by here in just a minute because I'm going to show you a translation that's different than this. We're not changing God's word. We're simply coming back and looking at some hermeneutics that will cause us to, to make a different understanding. But listen, it is our lives are bringing Him glory and the excellence of His name is being spread to the world. Listen, I don't know where you are in your spiritual walk, but this is the highest calling of man. To bring glory to God and to see him, his name lifted up in excellence. I'm going to have a talk with the trustees about this this afternoon when we get out of here. This highest form of excellence. You, you are called, listen, if you're a Christ follower, you're called to the highest form of excellence. Why? Because that's who he is. And as I told you in Colossians, because that's who you are in him. All right, so let's look at these little connecting words because this helps us understand what this is talking about. Seeing that his divine power granted to us, who's it to? Us. Everything pertaining to life and godliness through... Here's the means by which it's done, the true knowledge of Him. 
Well, pastor, why, why do you... Well, let me tell you about the first church I ever pastored, make an example of what I'm about to tell you. So I'd been there about six weeks. They had a rule I had to go to the back of the church and greet everybody as they left. They had a rule people had to leave at a certain period of time, and they had to go out that door. They couldn't go out any other door. They had to go out that door. And I had to be there to greet them. And so I'm standing there greeting people. And this one lady, for the first five weeks, she'd come by me, and she'd shake my hand, and she'd look at me kind of funny, and she'd go on out the door. Wouldn't say anything. So this is about week six. She came up to me. She shook my hand. She she looked at me right in the face. She leaned over, got right in my face. She said, Preacher, you sure do preach out of the Bible a lot. (laughs) yes through the true knowledge of him why do I preach out of the Bible a lot because it's about him it's not about us it's not about me it's not about what I want or you want or anybody else wants it's about him it's the true knowledge of him who called us by His glory and virtue. Well, it it could be by the fact that he has this glorious virtue, but the same word in the Greek could be, get a little technical here, but in the Greek there's this case of being locative. And in locative it would be translated to. It's spelled exactly the same. There's only one way to look at translating that properly, and that is the hermeneutics we've been talking about here occasionally on Wednesday nights. And, and this, I think, is a better translation here of this word. To his glory and virtue. It is for his glory that we live our lives every day. You know what? Part of our problem is we lose sight of that on Monday. We get so busy doing other stuff, we lose sight of the fact that our life is to bring glory to him. That's the whole purpose of our living here every day. The morning of my 40th birthday, this reality struck me. I'll never forget it. I was sitting out on our back deck overlooking Lake Norman. We, we thought we had the world by the tail. We were, we were making a lot of money. I was all but retired at age 40, and here I sat at a very nice home, We had another condo on that same lake. We had a place at Hilton Head. We had lots of stuff. And it hit me. All of that's going to burn. It's worthless. It's stuff. And there is nothing that that I'm going to put into a U-Haul to take to heaven with me. It's to his glory. It's to his glory. The ESV actually does translate this to his glory and virtue. God wants to change your life by his power that he's already granted to you. And he's telling him, tell us exactly how to do that through the true knowledge of him. The epinosco. Not, not the gnosis, not just knowing about him, but the knowledge that is applied to your life every day. He has supplied the power for that change and we are just the instruments through which it's going to happen. He wants to make you more like Jesus. That's the objective. That's the goal. John 13, 15. I have given you an example. You should do just as I have done for you. Here's my example, that I would die for you. I would pay the price for your sins, and this is your example I have done for you. Andrew Murray says this, not only should we think about Jesus himself and speak about him and believe in him, but we should come to the point that the, that the disciples did in the, the text arrived at, and their eyes were open. He's talking about that that Emmaus road walk where the disciples after the crucifixion and right after the resurrection, they didn't know Jesus had had raised from the dead, and they're walking with Jesus. And he has been so beaten and so abused and so tore up that they didn't recognize who he was. And the Bible says this, and, and and this is my prayer for this meeting this morning. Listen to me very carefully. 
The Bible says, and their eyes were opened. And their eyes were opened. That our eyes would be opened today. That we would hear from the living God that has already granted to you this promise and said, trust in me that you might have this power to live your life every day. The peace, the grace, the mercy of God, that peace that that is fleeting for people that don't know who he is. A peace that Philippians 4 says passes all human understanding. You don't have any right to have that peace. You're right. Except I'm a follower of Christ. And it's by His grace that I do. It's by His power, according to this promise, that I do. Not only that Jesus Himself would speak, or we speak to Him and believe in Him, that we should come to the point that we actually are laying our lives down. We open our eyes and see Him for who He is, and suddenly we trust in Him. Not only should we think about Jesus but we should know him in this way. So let's look at this. This text beginning in verse number four. Let's back up here. For by these he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises. By these what? By these He has granted us these magnificent promises. He has granted to you already. Do you get that? Does anybody not get that? He has granted to you already these promises in order that by them you might become, listen, partakers of the divine nature. One thing I know about partakers, in order to be a partaker, you have to receive the gift. If you're going to partake, you have to receive the gift. Open it up. Receive the power of God. Watch what He does in your life. That's what a partaker is. And He says, that you might become a partaker. That is your choice. Even as a a Christian, as a person that has accepted Christ, you have that choice today whether to do that or not. Whether to participate... Would you like to participate in this promise of God? Then you need to be a partaker. You need to receive it. Partakers of the divine nature, having escaped, here's here's one of the, the good things about this, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. You've escaped the corruption. That's is that good news? In order that by them, what is the them? The promises. That's what them is. In order that by them, the promises, you might become partakers of the divine nature. It's a checkbook. You get up tomorrow morning, your doorbell rings. In my case, somebody beats on the side of the trailer. And you go to the door, and here stands a guy with a check this big. And he says, Pastor Tom... You are a millionaire. And the check's made out for $7 million to Tom and Nancy Colbert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, and, and, what he, what, and, and Tom goes, yeah, right. I don't believe that for a minute. Or, I know they do that, but they don't ever come to my house. But when the guy leaves, he gives, he gives Tom and Nancy this big envelope, and they, they kind of throw it on the dining room table. And after a while, Nancy gets curious, and she goes over, and she tears it open. And she looks, and inside is this checkbook. And there's a balance in there of $7 million. Now, if they never write the check, they never are partakers of the gift they've been given. It's not until they trust that the money is there, that they believe it, 
that they pick it up and receive it and write the check out until that point in time they cannot partake of the gift they've been given. Do you get that? You have a divine checkbook, a promise of God for the power of God to do these things which God has called on you to do. Five, six, and seven. Now for this very reason, here's, he's going to tell us why. Also applying all diligence. How much diligence? Hmm. Wow. I think I'll just write the check but not sign it. Huh. With all diligence, I, I don't have time to sign it. I've got busy. I didn't feel good that day. When they delivered that check, I didn't feel good. Uh, <clears throat> okay. All diligence in your faith, here's that belief, that trust in the promiser, in your faith, supply moral excellence. Now, if you're going to call to moral excellence and it's by your own power, you and I might not survive. But he says, this is power I've already given you. This is, this is what I have given you, and what I've given you is a gift that will appropriate the ability to do every one of these things that you are incapable of doing by yourself. Moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, Self-control. Knowledge, this is the word gnosis. That's gaining information about who God is. Why do we open the doors of church on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and Pastor Tom teaches here? Why is that? Because you're going to learn something about God. That's why. And why do we do this at 11 o'clock? So you can get closer to God. So you can know how to bring application to your life. And why is it on Wednesday night we get into the depths of things? We're digging into Revelation. I had more people ask about Revelation than we're here Wednesday night. Does that tell you something? They haven't written the check. It's easy to ask me to study. 40 hours for a Wednesday night, and then they don't have an hour to come show up. Oh, I'm getting serious now. You, you were doing okay, preacher, to just then. Yes, sir. And in your knowledge, he says, comes self-control. Well, I just, don't, I just don't have any self-control. I just can't do this. I just don't think I... God has already appropriated the power and granted it to you. Self-control, perseverance. That means you keep going when other people quit. In your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness. Let's look at some of these words. Diligence, spadozo, zeal, urgency. Diligence really isn't a very good translation in the way we use it every day in the English language. It means that you are genuinely excited about this. It is a zealousness, a passion, a powerful emotional passion that is real in you, rooted in the truth of God's Word. It's an eagerness to go about doing it. it. Nobody has to twist your arm to do this. Nobody does. Why? Because you're eager to. You have this diligence. In your faith, it's not indolence. It's not apathy. It's not that you just don't care. That's the opposite of this word. And then you've got moral excellence. Arete, this is the word that just means goodness or excellence. It is the highest call for you to be that kind of example to the world. It's not a slacker, it's not a ripoff. This is epinoso, and that's the word that we talked about a little bit earlier for knowledge, applying what is known. It's self-control. It is the ability to control oneself, not, listen, I have just found that my discipline... My, my discipline of myself wears real thin when I'm, when I'm ill. My discipline for myself wears real thin when I'm tired. 
I'm not good at discipline at that point in time. So I have to be able to depend on the promise of his power, his ability, his thoroughness to work through, not, not to quit, but to work through that because of this perseverance, this self-control. It's the steadfastness. It's, perseverance is, I've, I've labeled it, a heroic toughness. Heroic toughness. It's keeping on, keeping on, keeping on, even in the face of whatever comes your way. It's not instability. That's what we're most all I. Godliness. This is an interesting word. Eusebomai. It's a, it's, it's, the word God really isn't in that word. It means reverence or respectful. It means that what I'm doing, I'm doing out of respect for who God is. And out of the fact that he has already appropriated and granted me this power, he must have something for me to accomplish. So I get up in the morning. My heater had stuck last night. So I woke up at 2.30 this morning and it was 91 degrees in our trailer. (laughs) And I hadn't been back to sleep since then. It is keeping going and doing what God has called you to do in spite of whatever those little circumstances and inconveniences are that happen. Because the enemy is going to be active as we talked about Wednesday night and as we talked about in 1 Peter. The enemy is going to be active. Anytime you are using the power of God in all of these areas, the enemy will take note. Then by brotherly kindness, this is the word Philadelphia or filio, brotherly love and affection. We do this with an expression of brotherly love because we love one another. Somebody doesn't come to me and say, well, Tom needs so-and-so, and I go, oh boy, Tom needs that, and I need to drive to Fortuna to do that. Okay. No, wrong attitude must come from the wrong power. I must be trying to discipline myself if that's my attitude. It's when I go, I think I can do that for him. Wouldn't it be cool that his issues could be resolved in the next hour? And God's given me the ability to do that. Why? Because he's already promised me this truth. Children, cool it. Got it? You're being distracted. It is an affection, a truth. This love is the agape love, and this is the ultimately what we're headed toward. All of these things lead to a decision to love. Agape is a choice. It's not a just an emotion it is a choice you make because guess what some of you have chosen to love Elva and I and you know what sometimes we're not real lovable and in those moments you're called to love us anyway so you see what I'm saying and that's the way it is with relationships husband wife relationships business relationships church relationships it's affection, but affection's not enough. It's really a choice. Verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. Do you want to be fruitful in the kingdom of God? Do you want to make a difference in other people's lives? I had one of the guys at the prison yesterday look at me and say, and, and like I say, the, the same guy that gave the, the soap, he, he looked at me and he said, I, I just I want to make a difference in people's lives. My whole view of my life has changed. It's, it's gone from survival mode where I'll do anything legal or illegal to survive to the point that I want to make a difference in people's lives by sharing Jesus Christ with them. My whole perspective has changed as of six months ago. That's this. Render you neither useless nor unfruitful. And how do we get there in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Verse number 9, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. You know, if you were 
If you had short-sightedness in those days, it was a serious problem. <clears throat> you couldn't just go get some glasses or some contact lenses. Couldn't do it. If you were totally blind, it was a real big deal. He says, if you lack these qualities, you are like a blind person struggling your way through this world, not making a difference because you're blind to the opportunities that lie before you. Listen to what it says. Short-sightedness, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. It is like saying, you have forgotten what Christ has done for you. You've forgotten who you are in him, cleansed by the blood of Christ. You've forgotten that your sanctification being ongoing, this purification is talking about. You've forgotten what that's like. I think I put it in here. The book of James has a passage on that. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Yep, there it is. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, for once he has looked at himself he, and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he is. You're missing it. Concluding questions. So here's the questions for you today. You ready? Have you hung with me so far? Do you have a position in Christ? If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, that's where you have to start. That's, that's the starting point. You, you do not just walk into and inherit the kingdom of God without making a choice. God has given you a choice. It is up to you. And if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to get that right today. Just, just don't let this day go by, please. If I could beg you into the kingdom, I would. Why? Because I know what's on that side. Do you have a position in Christ? If you don't, that's where you start today. Secondly, have you learned to, to believe and to focus on your position that's in Christ? That is, that is you're learning, you've learned to trust the fact of who he is and the promises he's made you. He has granted the scripture said to you already by his power the ability to do all these things that otherwise would be scary. But if I'm in his power and not having to generate that myself, I'm walking by his grace. I'm walking in his confidence. Have you appropriated, have you opened the envelope? Have you received the gift? Three, are you trusting God to change you? But I don't want to change, preacher. I'm perfectly happy just like I am. I don't need to change. I'm good compared to my neighbor. <laughs> and if you're a Christ follower... His, his desire is to continue to whittle away at everything in you that does not look like Jesus. And I'm sitting here looking at you all this morning, and you're looking at me. There's not one thing in either one of us that is perfectly like Jesus. We are not all that he is yet. But he has, con he has continued to promise us that he will whittle away at those things that are unlike Jesus if we'll appropriate his power. If we will trust him that what he tells us to do, he's already given us everything. Is that the word that was used? Everything? Everything we need. So those are our choices today. Maybe you need to make a choice today. Maybe you need to make a choice that you're going to either follow Christ starting today or you're going to walk closer to him. Maybe you need to make a choice today that, that you're going to prioritize him as the highest priority because of what he's already done for you and the promises he's already given you. Maybe that's where you need to be today. Or maybe, maybe like old Rob out at the prison you go, I'm 
and says, I, I, just, I just I don't know how God's going to use me when I get to that mission in, in Palm Springs, but whatever he's got for me, that's what I want. Just, I'm going to give it, I'm just going to give it all to him. Maybe you need to pray the prayer that, I, that I've learned that I need every single day. And it goes something like this, God, here I am again. And I don't have the power in myself. God, I don't even have the will in myself. I don't have anything that I think it takes for you to do, for me to do what you've called me to do. So here I am again because I need your power. I need, I need to appropriate what you've already given me. And I need you to help me appropriate that. I need the courage to do that. When nothing else makes sense, <laughs> I need the courage to do that. Now, Lord God, I pray that you will bless each one here, that you will touch lives, change hearts and minds, work in us to help us to understand what you have done in granting us this power and this grace and mercy that you've given us. Father, that promise that is the promise of promises. And I pray, Lord, that we would appropriate that as individuals and as a church, that we would be about our Father's business in the days ahead. And we pray these things in Christ's name.